from the venerable Penguin Classics edition of Plato's Republic. From, this is book seven, the cave simile. No doubt you've heard of this before. Or if you haven't, what are you doing here? Um, I'm just going to read this and try not to give any commentary. But, you know, unless you're as dull as a stone, um, you ought to see how these topics are timeless and they apply so well to all the craziness going on now. First, the introduction uh, by H.D.P. Lee here. Again, uh, book seven from Plato's Republic. The simile of the cave is a more graphic presentation of the truths presented in the analogy of the line, the divided line. In particular, it tells us more about the two states of mind called in the line analogy belief and illusion. We are shown the ascent of the mind from illusion to pure philosophy and the difficulties which accompany its progress. And the philosopher, when he has achieved the supreme vision, is required to return to the cave and serve his fellows, his very unwillingness to do so being his chief qualification. As Cornford pointed out, the best way to understand the simile is to replace the clumsier apparatus of the cave with the modern cinema. Or, considering this was put out in the 40s, think of a more modern analogy. <clears throat> it is the moral and intellectual condition of the average man from which Plato starts, and though clearly the ordinary man knows the difference between the substance and shadow in the physical world, the simile suggests that his moral and intellectual opinions often bear as little a relation to the truth as the average film does to real life. And so, it's the dialogue between Socrates and Glaucon, continuing, I want you to go on to picture the enlightenment or ignorance of our human conditions somewhat as follows. Imagine an underground chamber, like a cave, with an entrance open to the daylight and running a long way underground. In this chamber, there are men who have been prisoners there since they were children, their legs and their necks being so fastened that they can only look straight ahead of them and cannot turn their heads. Behind them and above, a fire is burning, and between the fire and the prisoners runs a road, in front of which a curtain wall has been built, like the screen at puppet shows between the operators and their audience, above which they show their puppets. I see. Imagine further that there are men carrying all sorts of great gear, gear along the curtain wall, including figures of men and animals made of wood and stone and other materials, and that some of these men, as is natural, are talking and some are not. An odd picture and an odd sort of prisoner. They are drawn from life, I replied. For tell me, do you think our prisoners could see anything of themselves or their fellows except the shadows thrown by the fire on the wall of the cave opposite them? How could they see anything else if they were prevented from moving their heads their entire lives? And would they see anything more of the objects carried along the road? Of course not. Then if they were able to talk to each other, would they not assume that the shadows they saw were real things? Inevitably. And if the wall of their prison opposite them reflected sound, don't you think that they would suppose, whenever one of the passers-by on the road spoke, that the voice belonged to the shadow passing before them. They would be bound to think so, yes. And so they would believe that the shadows of the objects we mentioned were, in all respects, real. Inevitably. Then think what would naturally happen to them if they were suddenly released from their bonds and cured of their delusions. Suppose one of them were let loose and suddenly compelled to stand up and turn his head and look and walk toward the fire, all these actions would be painful, and he would be too dazzled to see properly the objects of which he used to see the shadows of. So if he was told that what he used to see was mere illusion, and that he was now nearer reality, and seeing correctly, because he was turned toward objects that were more real, and if on top of that he were compelled to say that what each of the passing objects was when it was pointed out to him, don't you think he would be at a loss, and think that he used to see was more real than the objects now being pointed out to him? Much more real. And if he were made to look directly at the light of the fire, it would hurt his eyes, and he would turn back and take refuge in the things which he could see, 
which he would think re were really far clearer than the things being shown him. Yes. And if, I went on, he were forcibly dragged up the steep and rocky ascent and not let go till he had been dragged out into the sunlight, the process would be a painful one, to which he would much object. And when he emerged into the light, his eyes would be so overwhelmed by the brightness of it that he wouldn't be able to see a single one of the things that he was just told were real. Certainly not at first, he agreed. Because he knew he would need to grow accustomed to the light before he could see things in the world outside the cave. First, he would find it easier to look at shadows, next at the reflections of men and other objects in water, and later on at the objects themselves. And after that, he would find it easier to observe the heavenly bodies of the sky at night and then by day, and to look at the light of the moon and the stars rather than at the sun and its light. Well, yes, of course. The thing he would be able to do last would be to look directly at the sun and observe its nature without using reflections in water or any other medium, but just as it is. Yes, that must come last. Later on, he would come to the conclusion that it is the sun that produces the changing seasons and years and controls everything else in the visible world and is, in a sense, responsible for everything that he and his fellow prisoners once used to see. That is the conclusion he would certainly reach. And when he thought of his first home and what passed for wisdom down there, and of his fellow prisoners, don't you think that he would congratulate himself on his good fortune and be sorry for them? Very much so. There was probably a certain amount of honor and glory to be won among the prisoners, and prizes for keen-sightedness for anyone who could remember the order of sequence among the passing shadows, and so be best able to predict their future appearances. Will our released prisoner hanker after these prizes, or envy this power or honor? Won't he be more likely to feel, as Homer says, that he would, be, he would far rather be a serf in the house of some landless man, or indeed anything else in the world, than live and think as they do? Yes, he replied. He would prefer anything to a life like theirs. Then what do you think would happen, I asked, if he went back to sit in his old seat in the cave. Wouldn't his eyes be blinded by the darkness because he had come in suddenly out of the daylight? Certainly, yes. And if he had to discriminate between the shadows in competition with the other prisoners while he was still blinded and before his eyes got used to the darkness, a process that might take some time, wouldn't he be likely to make a fool of himself? And, it, and they would say that his visit to the upper world had ruined his sight, and that the ascent was not worth even attempting. And if anyone tried to release them and lead them up, they would certainly kill him if they couldn't lay hands on him. They certainly would. Now, my dear Glaucon, I went on, this simile must be connected throughout with what preceded it. The visible realm corresponds to the prison, and the light of the fire in the prison to the power of the sun. And you won't go wrong if you connect the ascent into the upper world and the sight of the objects there with the upper progress of the mind into the intelligible realm. That's my guess, which is what you are anxious to hear. The truth of the matter is, after all, known only to God. But in my opinion, for what it is worth, the final thing to be perceived in the intelligible realm and perceived only with difficulty is the absolute form of good. Once seen, it is inferred to be responsible for everything right and good, producing in the visible realm light and the source of light, and being in the intelligible realm itself controlling source of reality and intelligence. And anyone who is going to act rationally, either in public or private, must perceive it. I agree, he said, so far as I am able to understand you then you will perhaps also agree with me that it won't be surprising if those who get so far are unwilling to remit, return to mundane affairs, and if their minds lo long to remain among higher things. That's what we should expect if our simile is to be trusted. Yes, that's what's to be expected. Nor will you think it is strange that anyone who descends from contemplation of the divine to the imperfections of human life should blunder and make a fool of himself if, while still blinded and unaccustomed to the surrounding darkness, he's forcibly put on trial in the law courts 
and elsewhere about the images of justice or their shadows, and made to dispute about the conceptions of justice held by men who have never seen absolute justice. There's nothing strange in that. But anyone with any sense, I said, will remember that the eyes must be unsighted in two ways, by a transition either from light to darkness or from darkness to light, and that the same distinction applies also to the mind. See, when he sees a mind confused and unable to see clearly, he will not laugh without thinking, but will ask himself whether it has come from a clearer world and is confused by the unaccustomed darkness, or whether it is dazzled by the stronger light of the clearer world to which it has escaped from its previous ignorance. The first state is a reason for congratulation, the second for sympathy, though if one wants to laugh at it, he can do so with less absurdity than at the mind which has descended from the daylight of the upper world. You put it very reasonably. If this is true, I continued, we must reject the conception of education professed by those who say that they can put into the mind knowledge that was not there before, rather as if they could put sight into blind eyes. It is a claim that is certainly made, he said. But our argument indicates that this is a capacity which is innate in each man's mind, and that the faculty by which he learns is like an eye which cannot be turned from darkness to light unless the whole body is turned. In the same way, the mind as a whole must be turned away from the world of change until its eye can bear to look straight at reality, and at the brightest of all realities, which is what we call the good. Isn't that so? Yes. Then this business of turning the mind round might be made a subject of professional skill, which would affect the, con the conversion as easily and as effectively as possible. It would not be concerned to implant sight, but to ensure that someone who had it already was turned in the right direction and looking the right way. That may well be so. The rest, therefore, of what are commonly called qualities of the mind, perhaps resemble those of the body, in that they are not innate, but are implanted by training and practice. But the power of knowing, it seems, belongs to some diviner faculty, which never loses its power, but whose effects are good or bad according to the direction in which it is turned. Have you never noticed how shrewd is the glance of the type of man commonly called bad but clever? Their intelligence is limited, but their sight is sharp enough in matters that concern them. It's not that their sight is weak, but they put it to bad use, so that the keener is the worse its effects. That's true. But suppose, I said, that such natures were cut loose when they were still children, from the dead weight of worldliness, fastened on them by sensual indulgences like gluttony, which distorts their mind's vision to lower things, and suppose that, when so freed, they were turned towards the truth, then the same faculty in them would have as a keen vision of truth as it has of the objects on which it is at present turned. Very likely. And is it not also likely, and indeed a necessary consequence of what we have said, that society will never be properly governed either by the uneducated, who have no knowledge of the truth, or by those who are allowed to spend all their lives in purely intellectual pursuits? The uneducated have no single aim in life to which all their actions, public and private, are directed. The intellectuals will take no practical action of their own accord, fancying themselves to be no longer of this world. True. Then our job as lawgivers is to compel the best minds to attain what we have called the highest form of knowledge, and to ascend to the vision of the good as we have described. And when they have achieved this and seem enough, seen enough, prevent them behaving as they do now. What do you mean by that? Remaining in the upper world and refusing to return again to the prisoners in the cave below and to share their labors and rewards, whether they are worth having or not. But surely, he protested, that will not be fair. We shall be compelling them to live a poorer life than they might live. The object of our legislation, I reminded him again, is not the welfare of any particular class, but of the whole community. It uses persuasion or force to unite all citizens and make them share together the benefits which each individually can confer on the community, 
and its purpose in fostering this attitude is not to enable everyone to please himself, but to make each man a link in the unity of the whole. You are right. I had forgotten, he said. You see then, Glaucon, I went on, we shan't be unfair to our philosophers, but shall be quite justified in compelling them to have some care and responsibility for others. We shall tell them that philosophers in other states can reasonably refuse to take part in the hard work of politics, for society produces them quite involuntarily and unintentionally, and it is only just that anything that grows up on its own should feel it has nothing to repay for an upbringing which owes to no one. But you, we shall say, have been bred to rule to your own advantage in that of the whole community, like king bees, queen bees in a hive. You are better educated than the rest, and better qualified to combine the practice of philosophy and politics. You must, therefore, each descend in turn, and live with your fellows in the cave, and get used to seeing in the dark. Once you get used to it, you will see a thousand times better than they do once... Hang on. Once you get used to it, you will see a thousand times better than they do, and will recognize the various shadows, and know what they are shadows of because you have seen the truth about things right and just and good. And so our state and yours will be really awake, and not merely dreaming, like most societies today, with their shadow battles and their struggles for political power, which they treat as some great prize. The truth is quite different. The state, whose rulers come to their duties with least enthusiasm, is bound to have the best and the most tranquil government, and the state whose rulers are eager to rule the worst. I quite agree. Then will our pupils, when they hear what we say, refuse to take their share of the hard work of government, though spending the greater part of their time together in pure airs of philosophy? They cannot refuse, for we are making a just demand of just men. But of course, unlike present rulers, they will approach the business of government as an unavoidable necessity. Yes, of course, I agreed. The truth is that if you want a well-governed state, you must find for your future rulers some career they like better than government. For only then will you have government by the truly rich, those, that is, whose riches consist not of money, but of happiness, of a right and rational life. If you get in public affairs men who are so morally impoverished that they have nothing they can contribute themselves but who hope to snatch some compensation for their own inadequacy from a political career, there can never be good government. They start fighting for power, and the consequent internal and domestic conflicts ruin both them and society. True indeed. Is there any other life except that of true philosophy which looks down on political power? None that I know of. And yet the only men to get power should be men who do not love it, although otherwise we shall have rivals' quarrels. That is certain. Who else, then, are we to compel to undertake the responsibilities of ruling if it is not to be those who know most about good government and who, value, who yet value other things more highly than politics and its rewards? There is no one else.